I've been in this room before, and I was thinking about the connection of where we're going tonight and the big important issues that we're debating and you will be debating over the coming months and how connected we all are to this. Because when I spoke in this room the last time I was here, I wasn't talking to an audience about education. The people in this room all worked for an organization, and I think I pronounce it right, called Pooch, who are the big perfume and cosmetics organization that I think were founded by a, a Catalan family and now are one of the biggest uh, perfume and cosmetics industries in the world. And Pooch, is that right? Pooch, not bad. Pooch, okay. So them, anyway, that, that, that group of people. Um, and I was talking to them. They invited me to speak to a full room of their managers and leaders because they were finding it really hard to convince their own staff that they needed to think differently behave differently, and act differently as an organization. They were having a conversation about how could they ensure that Puj had a future, not just in the 21st century, but in the 22nd century. And the reason they asked me along was to help them understand why the education system had caused the problems it had created in the way its staff thought and behaved around challenges of the future. So this is not just a problem for educators. This isn't just a group of people talking together in ideology or theory about why education should be different. This is already having a profound impact on all of our futures. And I'm going to say the same thing to you at the start of my speech that I said to them. We've got to stop talking about the 21st century like it's something that is in the future. And as educators, here is a frightening thought for you. The children who started in our schools this year will be citizens in the 22nd century. The 21st century is done in terms of education. We are now in the business of preparing children for the 22nd century. I also want to lay down another provocative challenge because we have all been talking about the future of education and how are we going to prepare our children for the 21st century for many, many years. But maybe a question we can come back to when we get into the debate later. How much has really changed? In all the years we've been talking about preparing our education system for the future and the things that need to happen in order to educate our children for the future, how much has really changed? We've done a lot of talking, which has led, actually, I believe, to a lot of confusion. We've actually, in many ways, I think, been guilty of overcomplicating education. We have made it into too much of a political and intellectual debate. And as a result, I believe too many people in our societies have become too confused, have become 
alienated. Many of our teachers have become frustrated, angered. A lot feel vulnerable and threatened by the level of argument and discussion. And I actually believe that we've got to stop talking now. And we have to start doing something. Because very soon, if we don't start doing something, there will be somebody stood on this same stage talking about how are we going to prepare our children for the 23rd century and the 22nd century will have disappeared. So I want to start, if I can, by taking us backwards to what I believe is the greatest lever for change in education. And that is to remind ourselves, maybe, what education is for. Why are we educating children? What is the purpose of education? You see, I worry at the moment, particularly in the West and particularly in most of Western Europe, the debate has become so political. It's not about children anymore. Most of the arguments you hear aren't about children. They're about politicians delivering their version of politics through education policy. It's about unions protecting members. But very little of the debate I hear in reality is about kids. And the truth is, I think the fundamental principles of education have changed little and need to change little. And before we start to think about the future, I think we need to be very clear about our vision and purpose for education. So I hope you'll forgive me, but I'd like to spend a couple of minutes sharing with you my philosophy of education to see if it matches yours. And if it doesn't, that's fine. But maybe we can talk further about that in the debate that follows. But let me explain to you why I became a teacher. What makes my heart beat faster when I'm allowed to spend time with a group of young people? What, as a school leader, drove me to lead a school in a totally different direction? It wasn't about innovating. It wasn't about being anti-political. It wasn't about being anti-anything. It was just an opportunity to have the privilege of doing the things that I believe matter to all children throughout history and in the future. The difference is the content of that process. So here it is. There are three words that drive my passion around education. The first is this. I believe education above all things is about the celebration of life. It is the celebration of our children's lives. It is about helping them to understand the power and potency of their future. To raise their heads, to look at their aspirations, at their dreams, at their interests, at their skills, at their uniqueness, and the potential of their lives, and the value of living their lives in the fullest degree. It's about helping them understand and celebrate who they are as individuals, as members of a community, as members of a society, as members of a global family. That, to me, is the core principle of education. It's not about how many grades you get in an examination, how high we appear in a league table published by some economic organization in another part of Europe. That's not what it's about. It's about raising the aspirations and celebrating the values 
of our children. And I worry. I worry because, as I've already said, I think often when it comes to policy and debate and discussion about education, they come down here somewhere in the list. I'm not going to criticize this gathering, by the way, but I am going to set you a challenge. You're debating the future of education. Where are the children? There should be children in this room. There should be young people here to debate with us about what their hopes and dreams and aspirations and values are. There should be young people in this room telling us what they want from an education system. So I beg you, the next time you convene this meeting, to ensure that young people are invited to be here too. Otherwise, with all due respect, it's just a group of the same people talking about what we think they need. And actually, they should be here too. Their voice is important. You see, I read a quote from a book at the turn of, a, at the, turn of the millennium, the beginning of the 21st century, a book that I would suggest if you can find it, you should get hold of. I don't know if it's translated into, into Spanish. I hope so. But it's a book called The School I'd Like. And it was written by two professors of education and published in the year 2000. And these two professors of education traveled around the United Kingdom talking to young people between the ages of 3 and 18. And basically, the book is filled with quotes from these young people in response to the one question, what would your ideal school be like? And it's split into different chapters about curriculum and discipline and good teaching and good learning and rules and behavior. It's fantastic. And it's one of those books you can open at any page. You don't have to read from cover to cover. And you will get something profound from the pages of this book. And as I read this book, I came across one quote that stood out for me as possibly the most provocative thing I have ever heard anybody say about education ever. And it came from the mouth of a young woman who, when she was interviewed, was 16 years old. And she was asked, what would your ideal school be like? And she said this in response. In my ideal school, we will no longer be treated like a herd of an identical wild animal waiting to be civilized for the outside world. You will realize and respect that it's my world too. And I think that's one of the greatest challenges we face as educators, as policymakers, as people with an interest in education. Education is not about control. It was when mass education was first brought to the populace 150 years ago, it was about control. But education now has to be about empowerment. Too many decisions, I believe, around education are made because it's how the adults want it to be, not because it's the right way for our students. Let me give you an example. I have been into many schools and debated with many teachers, including my own in my own schools. And often, the arguments against change would come because change threatened teachers. The teachers would argue against certain change because it made them feel uncomfortable. And so I believe there's a critical lens that we must put to all of our debates, and it's this. It doesn't matter whether it makes our teachers feel uncomfortable. That's not what we're here for. And in many ways, if we want our children to be more creative, more innovative, better at taking risks, then our teachers have to be the ones who step out of their comfort zones 
first. We cannot expect to change the way our children behave in the world if educators themselves aren't prepared to change first. And actually the greatest challenge of education transformation is that we are going to have to step a long, long way out of our comfort zones if we're truly to lead a system worthy of our children in the 22nd century. Too often, we don't do things because we don't want to take the risks. So, one of the lenses we must always ask is, are we doing this because it's how we like it, or are we doing it because it's the right thing to do for our students? My second word is not possibly surprising to any of us, because it is without argument that education and learning in particular is the greatest gift that any civilized society can bestow on its children. No one would argue. No one would argue that in order to educate young people with the skills they need not just to survive but thrive in their future, we need, amongst other things, to make sure that they are literate and that they are numerate and that those things will always form the core to our education process. However, learning, I believe, in too many of our schools around the world today, to most children, is just a means to prepare to take examinations. And of course, the gift of learning and the gift of education should be so much bigger than that. But when you ask young people about the purpose of education, they all will tell you in one way or another that it's to help them prepare to take another exam. It's a strange form of motivation, don't you think? That what we say to our young children is, work really hard at school. Why, mummy? Because then you'll do well in your tests. And what happens if I do well in my tests, mummy? You get to take more tests. <laughs> and if I do well in those tests, mummy, what happens? You get the chance to take more tests. And then what? And then you might go to university. And what happens at university? They'll teach you to take even bigger tests. <laughs> That's not the purpose of education. Is it any wonder that so many of our young people leave education angry, dissatisfied, unhappy? Because a lot of our kids turn around and they go, you know what? I don't want to take any more tests. I want to learn something that interests me, that fires my imagination, that makes me feel excited about something, that makes me want to delve deeper and work harder in order to transform my own life. Learning has to matter for now for our children. Most children don't think about tomorrow, and why should they? When they're six or seven or eight years of age, the joy is in living life for the moment. So we need to make sure that our learning is constructed so that it means something for our children now, that it's irresistible, it's exciting, and it matters to them for the moment. There is a wonderful story from one of the great American progressive educators. And if you once studied him, I urge you to return to his words and his work. And if you've never heard of him, I urge you to look him up and study his words and his work. His name was John Holt. John Holt was one of the great progressive educators. And when he was coming to his retirement, he had built a list, like so many of us do, of things in his life he'd always wanted to do, but never had the time or the opportunity. 
And as he was coming to his retirement, his wife knew about this list. It was one of the things that they would talk about frequently. I'm sure you do. On a Saturday evening with a nice bottle of wine, you talk about all the things you wish you had the time or energy to do, but you're too exhausted or you just don't have the time. And he had this list. And she knew that at the top of his list, his greatest regret was that he'd never learnt to play a musical instrument. And the musical instrument he'd always wanted to learn was how to play the cello. And his wife, as a surprise when he retired, found a local music teacher and organized for him to learn to play the cello. So he started learning to play the cello. And after a few months and thoroughly enjoying learning to play the cello, his music teacher said, let's have a cup of coffee and talk about how it's going. And she started talking to him about what a good student he was and what sort of music she thought he might be interested to learn and where to go next. And when she'd finished, she said to John, have you got any questions for me? And he said, just one, just one question. He said, with a smile on his face, for months now, I've been telling my friends that I'm learning to play the cello. He said, when can I tell them I'm playing the cello? Now, I don't know about you, but one of the big problems with the way society perceives childhood and perceives education in particular is that it's preparation to become something else. Somehow, education is almost like the Catholic view of purgatory. It's like you have to go through it before you can get somewhere else. How many of us are guilty of saying to our own children, I know you don't like school, darling, but we've all had to do it. Like, that's the answer. Right? So the learning has to matter for the moment. And in order for the learning to matter for the moment, we need to understand and value the things our children enjoy, the things that excite them, the things that they get enthused about that makes their hearts beat faster. Too often, what happens with formal education is we tell our children to leave everything they're interested in at the door of the classroom because now we're going to teach them important things. And of course, that is a challenge in itself because there was a time where children would believe that. There was a time where the job of a teacher was to be the person who passed the knowledge to the child. Today, children look at us and they say, I don't need you to tell me stuff. I can find stuff out for myself. What is your job as my teacher? Because the respect can no longer be there because of what we know. So our jobs have to be different. And the great challenge is how do we tie the things that they're interested in with the skills we know they need to develop to create a learning environment that is irresistible, that is somewhere they want to be, that is things they want to learn. And that isn't going to be decided by our politicians or our unions or anybody else. That can only be done by truly skilled educators who truly understand the needs and the interests of their students. Which means we cannot develop an education system that is predicated on one system for everybody. My guess is that those of you in this room who are teachers will all teach in different schools in different parts of the city, with a different group of children who have different backgrounds, different family situations, different socioeconomic standards and situations, which means that every one of our children in every one of our communities is different. 
So if we're going to define a future of education policy, it has to be flexible enough to allow different communities to mold that policy for the, for the needs of its individual children and its individual communities and groups of children. We cannot ever again allow any government to deliver one system that every child in every community has to study in the same way. That's very much the traditional model of learning and it is simply no longer fit for purpose. You know, we talk a lot about the great crises that we're living through right now. The, the economic crisis, which is undeniable and huge. The environmental crisis, which potentially is even bigger, because of course it might not be long before the planet is simply not capable of sustaining life on it anymore. And thirdly, the massive crisis around socio-ethnic strife around the world. I think there's a fourth crisis, and I think it's the greatest crisis of them all. And I think that our formal education system is squandering human resource. Because our system values one type of intelligence. Our system of education values one system. And so many of our kids are alienated by that system because they're not academic, because they're not very good at taking examinations. Yet some of those children may be the ones that hold the secret to solving the economic crisis, to solving the environmental crisis, and to solving the socio-ethnic strife around the world. And that's one more reason why we have to create a system of education that is built on the development of the individual, not just the individual of the whole group. And that's one of our biggest challenges. And here's my third word. My third word is nothing very clever, and some, pay pe pe some people might say is frivolous. I don't believe it is. Of course, education is a serious business. But the key for me about great schools and great learning environments is they are always filled with laughter. Education has to be, at its heart, fun and enjoyable. People often ask me about where I go, what the greatest schools I visit look like, what do they have in common? What do the greatest teachers look like? What do they have in common? And there is one principle that I know above everything else. And that is the best classrooms I've ever visited, the best schools I've ever visited, are places that are filled with laughter. And I mean the right kind of laughter, by the way. I'm not talking about crazy laughter. I'm not talking about the kind of laughter you might find in a place that is just anarchic. I'm talking about the right kind of laughter. Because what I know for sure is the greatest teachers are relaxed enough to be themselves with their students. And if, they're, if the teachers are relaxed enough to be themselves with their students, the students are relaxed enough to be themselves. If what we do is we rule our classrooms through fear, we are only gaining a small percentage of the potential learning that, that could go on in those classrooms. And what I always say is the teachers that have to rule their classrooms with fear and rules are probably not great teachers. So again, I think, like all things, we have to translate that up to upwards. Our politicians need to learn that they cannot control an education system through threat and fear and pressure. It will not work, and it will not drive education to its fullest potential. We need to create an environment of considered professionalism, of mutual respect, and that also means that we as professionals have to act with great professionalism. We have to be prepared to do the things I've talked about already, to take risks, to step outside our comfort zones, to research, to investigate, to constantly explore, to take on new challenges. But we need to expect the people that run our systems do the same thing.
because fear will only lead to a minimum level of success. In education, what we're seeing at the moment around the world is those countries like the UK and Spain that are using the threat of league tables and exam results to drive their education systems forward are all staggering. They're all stopping their progress and development. They're all hitting their ultimate level. They can go no further. The systems where education around the world is at its most dynamic are systems that are freer, that are about professional involvement, that are about collaboration, creativity, and development beyond the examination, beyond the traditional measures. You know, it's very interesting, don't you think, that a country like China, which has, of course, developed probably the most efficient system of traditional education the world has ever known. And they've developed that system in probably no more than 30 years. Today, it's the most efficient system of traditional education on the planet, educating billions of young people to the point where everybody looks at the OECD PISA League tables now and goes, oh, China, Shanghai. Isn't it fascinating? I don't know if you saw this, but you know the Chinese government is currently in transition. We're moving from the old uh, guard, the people that have run China for the last 10 years, and now there's a new generation of leaders taking over the Chinese government. And in a speech, the, education, the new education secretary gave just before Christmas, they said this. They said if China is to have a future, it needs to discover and nurture the next generation of Steve Jobs. Currently, China is nowhere near doing that because our education system is too intense, too based on academic development, and there is no space and time to nurture the individual or their interests. And as a result, the Chinese government are about to embark on the most radical education transformation program in their history. And part of that program is to move away from the academic pressures of the traditional system. Now, I think that's a very scary thought because their government already understands it and they're already moving away strategically from exactly what's put them top of the OECD PISA tables. Meantime, uh, all of us in Western Europe, America, Australia are so fixated with the PISA tables, we're trying to design systems to compete with a league table that even the Chinese and the South Koreans and the Singaporeans are now saying is no good to us. They're moving away. So where do we need to go? What needs to happen next? I was very lucky. A couple of weeks ago, I... Uh, was giving a speech in Saudi Arabia, which is interesting, by the way, in itself, because Saudi Arabia gets the challenge too. Now, of course, Saudi Arabia, unlike the rest of us at the moment, is blessed with huge wealth because of its oil. And they describe it as the black dollar, black for oil, the black dollar. But the Saudi people know that the black dollar is running out. And whilst it was the creation of massive wealth, they know it's not a sustainable economic model. So they are now investing billions of dollars that they've gained from the oil wealth that they've generated in creating a new philosophy, a new economy that they're calling the green dollar, which is all about creating a society for the future that do, will derive its income from innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, and enterprise. And again, they are transforming very, very quickly their education system. Their route to that is by embracing masses of amounts of new technology. I'm not entirely sure it's right, but they certainly are showing the right kind of direction. But at the conference I was speaking at, I got the chance, one of the other speakers, and it's very rare any of us get the chance to do this, one of the other speakers was a man who has genuinely changed the world. And I was really lucky because I shared a seven-hour flight with him. We sat next to each other on our flight from Saudi Arabia back to London. 
And I got seven hours. I'm sure he wanted to sleep, but I wanted to talk to him. <laughs> and he was too polite to tell me to shut up. So there you go. But, you know, when you're sat next to a man for seven hours who's changed the world, you're going to use it, right? Now, the man in question, his name is Steve Wozniak. Mm. Steve Wozniak, of course, is the brains behind Apple. Steve Jobs was the face of Apple. Steve Wozniak was the man who created the computer systems. He was the genius behind Apple computers. So... He's a man who you can genuinely look at and say, you changed the world. And I got to sit next to him and we were talking about a number of things. And one of the things the world doesn't know about Steve Wozniak is when he left working for Apple full time, he spent the next five years of his life working as a state school teacher in a, in a state school in a socially deprived community in the suburbs of San Francisco. He did it for free, because of course he didn't need the money, but he taught technology in this school to grade five students. Now my first thought was, how cool would it be to have Steve Wozniak as your technology teacher? Right? But what I loved about that was this man had an authentic understanding of the challenges of education. And he said to me, you know, the first thing I learned, Richard, was it's really not important what you teach. He said, what's important is how you learn. And he said, that's something I've known for many, many years. Because he talked to me about the Apple and the expansion of Apple. And he said, once Apple started to grow, and he said it started to grow at a ridiculous rate. You know, neither Steve or I knew what we were creating when we launched Apple. We had no idea how fast things were going to evolve. But he said, we started to have to think very, very quickly about recruitment and mass recruitment of people to work with us in Apple. He said, the one thing we did know was that we couldn't recruit people who would just make stuff. Because Apple, if it was to have a future, would have to be a place that kept inventing stuff, that kept changing things. He said, so we developed a philosophy very early on that drove our recruitment principle. And he said, I can tell you what it was in one sentence. He said, we decided that at Apple, we simply couldn't employ anyone that needed to be managed. Let me just leave that in your head for a minute. We can't employ anybody that needs to be managed. Now, I think there, in one elegant sentence, is the challenge for us as we explore 22nd century education. How do we design an education system that stops our children being trained to be managed? Because if we think about the principles of education, it's fascinating to me that we look at children and think they need to be taught. And in the last few years, that we think that we need to teach children how to learn. Because if we go right back to the earliest stages of our childhood, from the minute we come from the womb, from the minute we're born, we are born into a world, to us, that is completely uncertain, that is about nothing except change, that there is no security. And from the minute we're born, we are born instinctively as the perfect learning machine. Experts tell us that we learn somewhere between 70 and 75% of everything we learn in our lifetimes before we're five years of age. We learn to walk and talk. We learn to make sense of the world around us. We learn about smell and sound and touch and sight. And we learn all of these things before anybody sits us in a classroom and tells us what to learn or how to learn. We are born 
not needing to be managed. But then what happens is we put children into formal education. And the first thing we teach children in formal education is the only things worth learning are the things we're going to tell you need to be learnt. And the reason they're the only things worth learning is because those are the things we're going to test you on. So what happens is most children remove the natural instinct of inquiry and learning. They lose the ability to self-manage. And what they then do is they sit there and they say, right, you'll tell me what I need to learn. You'll tell me how I need to learn it. And you'll tell me if I've done it correctly. So now I'm handing the management of my life over to you. And then what happens? Our kids enter the workplace, some straight from school, some from university. And they enter a workplace that when they started the journey 21 years ago, they were told that if they did that and they showed they could be managed, that they would end up with great jobs for the rest of their lives. Because that, of course, is what the 20th and 19th century did value. We lived in an industrial age. We lived in an age where the perfect life was to get a job in a big company where you could prove your skill and talent at doing what they needed you to do over and over and over again. That you could be managed. That you would do what you're told to do to the best of your ability. That you would be efficient. And those same children, we forget, don't we? 21 years ago, the world was a different place. Spain was a different place. The vast majority of our young people, if they went through education and learnt how to be managed, would end up with degrees from universities, would end up with good jobs in good companies that would see them live a successful middle-class life well into their retirement. And those same children are the ones I now see sat on the benches by the roadside, in the parks, going, what happened to your promise? And now they're waiting to be managed. They're waiting for somebody to come along and say, here's the job, here's the money, this is what we want you to do. And what I see in some of the most dynamic and exciting places in the world today is an education system where young people are being taught to invent jobs for themselves, to go out and find opportunity, to create their own businesses, to collaborate with other like-minded people, to set up their own solutions, to find ways of it being monetized. And I have to tell you, I am really optimistic, actually, in the long term about Spain's future. Because some of the most entrepreneurial young people I've met, I've met actually in Madrid, but I met at a series of new technology business in, uh, conferences where I met young people between the ages of 19, 20, 21 years of age who have come together and are starting their own businesses that are, have it understood the world of the app and new technology and are building solutions for themselves. So the question I ask you, the challenge we all face in the West right now is how do we build a 22nd, edu 22nd century education system that trains our children not to be managed, that trains our children that the world is there if they're prepared to seize it, that trains our children to go out and look for possibility, built on a profound understanding of who they are as individuals, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, what their interests are. How do we develop an education system that is built around the concept of living life lifelong learning and laughter. Thank you very much indeed. Actually, there are great teachers doing great things here in Catalonia, here in Barcelona, in Spain, in the UK, in the US, all over the world. And they're doing those things within the conditions that already exist. I think there's a perception, you know, we have, first of all, have to remember that politicians only have certain levers that they can pull. They don't control the system, actually. Teachers can. But we need to spend more time 
underneath policymakers, explaining the challenges and why they're the challenges. You know, a lot of parents want the best, all parents want the best for their children. But what they perceive to be the best is only based on what they understand of education. And many parents, of course, were successfully educated in a traditional system. And I don't blame them, therefore, for when they have children of their own, for saying, well, I want the best that is available now of what I experienced. So the first thing is we have to start a consciousness raising with people outside of education when I talk about why education has to change. And what I do is I show them a different league table from the PISA league table. You see, the problem partly is the media. The media only ever report bad news around education. And the media love the PISA league tables because it tells them that Spain are rubbish and England are rubbish and we're all rubbish. And therefore, parents turn to politicians to go save us from this rubbish. But I want to show you a different kind of league table. This is a league table produced by an organization called GEDI, the Global Entrepreneurship and Development Institute. And they publish a league table every year of 79 participating nations currently of what percentage of their economic growth is dependent on new business, entrepreneurship, and enterprise. Now, what I've done is scrambled up the list. That's not the order. Those are some of the countries, but they're mixed up. So just for five seconds, turn to the person next to you and from that list, choose the countries you think are most likely to be in the top three. You ready? Go. <laughs> okay, that'll do. Let's see. Now on the next slide, I'm going to show you where they came in the 2012 league table in order, and in brackets in red, where they came in the whole list of 79 participating nations. To make it easier for you, because I know you'll be interested because it's your country, I've put Spain completely in red so you can pick it out quickly. Are you ready? Now, if I was an educator or somebody who was trying to convince the public that the education system needed to change, I would suggest that the Gedi League table is far more important to our economic future than the PISA League table. I would then ask them to look at who is at the top of the list. Now, America is interesting in a way like so many things. And I can say, I'm, you know, I love America. But they have an unfair advantage because when you have companies like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple at your heart, they are always going to... Interestingly, though, in 2011, they were fourth in the list. But Sweden and Australia both have holistic education systems which are committed to develop, uh, about development of the whole child. They aren't rigid traditional academic systems. When you look at the bottom of the list, you find many of the countries that people think are at the top. Brazil, India, China, Russia. Of course, they're in the heart of their industrial revolutions right now. But the future of our economic growth is dependent on entrepreneurship and enterprise. Look where Spain is, 29th. If I was the public in Spain right now, I would be demanding a rapid transformation in the education system to ensure that this is the kind of league table we find ourselves pushing up on. So I guess it's a long way round of saying we need to educate the public ourselves into understanding why this is the challenge. We can't hope to do this en masse in one go. The way we do it is the same way we harness the power of our teachers. We have to free up those teachers that think innovatively, that behave innovatively, that have interesting and exciting things to do. 
We do that by creating a culture of action research amongst those teachers, allowing them to trial in their own classrooms the thing they do, not waiting to be told the whole school has to do it or being given permission at a whole school level or a policy level. We have to allow those individual teachers the chance to experiment, to explore. And then, by bringing those teachers together through formal and informal networks, you create a culture of contagion. You know the model? If one person sneezes, two people catch a cold. If two people catch a cold and they sneeze, four people catch a cold. Four people sneeze, eight, and soon you have contagion. What we've got to stop doing is trying to persuade the policymakers to allow a new system in one go. What we have to do is develop a culture of contagion where our teachers are given the opportunity to explore, that they can share their practice with other teachers, they can start sharing and convincing parents and other teachers then that it works because they have models that they can demonstrate that work. And from that, you can have conversations with parents about the kind of things you can do at home. And what I would suggest is that the one thing you can do straight away as a parent is not fixate with your child at home at doing the academic things they do at school, but encourage an interaction at home which allows your children to develop those skills in real situations. So I was on the BBC on Monday having this same conversation, and one of the examples I gave was, I know time is difficult for parents, but once a week, cook with your child. But I mean from a, a recipe book. Because what that does with young children is it gets them to demonstrate and practice their reading. It gets them to show you that they can measure in quantity and they understand math. It gets them to be a bit creative because you might say, but what would happen if instead of putting that ingredient in, we chose something else? So that they're experimenting and they're exploring and they're creating. So the job for a parent who wants to make a difference is to do that to take those kind of, and just allow your child to play with you to sh in areas where they can show and demonstrate that they're developing those skills, but in freer thinking ways. Elements for change and the, the restrictions to change. I, I think the first thing is that as a profession right now, suspicion of change is big, is a big issue because, and it leads to one of the great problems. Um, a lack of perceived empowerment, a lack of believing you're in control of change is a big blocker, a big resistor to change. And for too many years, I think education and educators have been used to being told what to do and how to do it, much like we tell our children. And of course, every time we have a new government, they rip up what the last government did and they give us a new thing to change. So that's led to, uh, I hope this translates, Skepticism. People no longer believe in the change processes they're being asked to engage in. And often for teachers, the first uh, instinct when they're told about change is to resist it because they don't feel they have ownership. So for me, um, at a local level, the first thing we have to do with our colleagues is to do a little bit what I started off this evening doing, which is try and return them to the point of passion, the point at why they chose to work in education, to remind them of the excitement they felt when they chose to become an educator, to ask them why they chose to become an educator, and then to do something very similar to what I was talking about in response to the first few questions, which was to give permission to teachers who were ready as a school leader, to say to those people, I, if you have an idea, go with it. I'll protect you. I'm giving you permission. Go and try it out. And when you've tried it out, come back and tell us how it went. But I'm giving you the permission to go and try it. But in return, I expect you to be honest about sharing what happened, you know, so that you're beginning a, a period of... of you're demanding professionalism from your teachers, but you're giving them 
professional conditions. So for me, the core, I suppose it's not two of one and two of others. It's about how do we help them rediscover their passion and how do we allow them to feel empowered and in control of change process and at the same time make sure they understand the responsibilities they carry with that, that they must share their responses, that they must be honest, that they must be generous in being prepared to allow other people in on, on that journey. One of the great challenges, and again the problem in both situations, you identify exactly one of the problems. We are so fixated in uh, our society with systems and structures. Everything is about systems and structures first. When I look at organisations and companies and where their greatest problems come, their people have been so used to being given systems and structures to action. Those people aren't involved in developing the process of change. They're just used to implementing other people's change. So it might not necessarily be in books, but it might be in conversations that the process starts. And for me, in my experience, it's always about asking abstract questions and developing conversations. So I'll give you an example from my own experience. So when I took over my school, as some of you know, it was a very uh, struggling, very low-performing school. It was filled with professionals who were damaged and angry and resistant to change. And I remember going to my first meeting and they expected me to teach, to give them a new system or a new structure because there had been eight head teachers in 10 years. Eight school principals had gone through this school in 10 years. And they were just used to the new school principal coming in like a government and going, this is what I want you to do now. And I walked into the meeting, maybe because actually I'm not as clever as those other school principals. Maybe I went, into, uh, I went into that first meeting and the first question I asked them was this. How do we turn our school into Disneyland? And they all sat there and went, what? Then they all thought, this man's mad. But actually my point was this. How do you create a learning environment so irresistible and so exciting that kids would queue up every day to get in? You know, if you were at Disneyland in Paris and your little child had a cold, they wouldn't go, uh -huh, uh -huh, I'm too ill to go to school, to, I don't want to go to Disney, would they? They'd get out of bed and say, don't worry about the cold, I want to go to Disney anyway. How could you create a culture in a school that felt like that? Now, the interesting thing is, it was an open question. It was an abstract question. And what came of that first question were people talking about lessons. Well, why doesn't a lesson feel exciting? How can we make it more exciting? Somebody else would say, I've been to Disneyland and I know what those rides feel like, so how could we recreate that feeling? Do you see what I'm saying? So it doesn't necessarily have to come from a book, but what we do need to do is ask abstract questions that allow professionals space and time to begin debate, which will lead to action research, which leads to teachers who might have a go at something, and the journey uh, begins. One of the things we should do is build in every secondary school in the country what I called a business incubation unit. So any child, 14, 15, 16 years of age, that had an idea for a new business should be allowed to start that business in school with the expertise and protection of being in school, with having the expertise and protection around them. And even if the business failed, the learning experience that the, that young person may had may convince them that going to university wasn't necessary, that by 18 they were ready to go out and start a new business or work in a new start business. So there needed to be, there need to be alternatives and there need to be powerful alternatives. You know, some countries around the world have fantastic vocational routes after school. So a lot of young people, for example, in Austria, where they have a very powerful vocational alternative, which society values as high 
as university. Means, of course, that they're developing a huge number of highly skilled engineers, for example, because the, the vocational training system is so strong. So we need to look at very powerful, very real alternatives to a university structure that gain credibility because people can see the benefits of what happens to those young people by p pursuing those, those avenues uh, and routes. Which leads me to your question, because project-based learning, I think, is vital. It goes to something I was saying in my speech. If learning matters to our students, it matters when they can do stuff with the learning. Children learn so much at a very young age because so much of their learning is based around role play. You know, when a young child, a preschool child learns best, they pretend to be their mum or their dad. Sometimes they pretend to be a doctor and they come home and they, they, they t you, you walk through the door as a parent and your child says, you're very, very ill, mummy. And mummy goes, am I? And the child says, yes, lie down on the sofa and I'll take your... T you know what I mean? And children engage in learning and they're learning incredible things because it feels real. And one of the benefits of project-based learning is it has that feeling for older students. So, for example, at Grange, one of our projects that I'll quickly share with you was over a term, a group of nine-year-old children were, they wanted to study a period, they wanted to study food through the ages. They wanted to study the history of food. So the teacher negotiated, and this is the other thing. Children can suggest projects, but then the project is evolved through negotiation. So the teacher has a, an input too, but the children feel a sense of ownership. So with this project, together they decided that the term's work was going to be to build a restaurant that would serve food through the ages. So that you could go to their restaurant and you could order a Stone Age starter, and you could order a 1970s main course, and a pudding from the 1800s. And what that led to then was the way the teacher would design the whole project to make sure the children were learning everything they needed to learn. So the project would be centered around, for example, four strands, because at Grange we had four strands rather than lots of subjects in our curriculum. The four strands were communication, enterprise, culture, and well-being. And the best way to explain those strands is to tell you how they worked in this project. So they were going to build this restaurant. So in communication, they were going to have to learn about marketing and advertising. They were going to have to learn about how to set out a menu and the language and vocabulary of menu writing. So you can see a massive amount of literacy development. They were also going through enterprise. They had to learn the core mathematics because they were going to have to design their restaurants. They were going to have to learn about scale drawing. And they would have to learn about area and shape and space. They were also going to have to cost their restaurants. They were going to have to learn about wages and the cost of raw materials and how much you could charge people so that you could get that money back and afford to pay people wages and pay for the material ingredients you needed. So you can already see, I guess, a massively rich experience which is teaching the basic skills in a way that is far broader and more exciting. With the cultural experience, uh, the scientific part of the cultural experience, the children, because they were going to be cooking food, would have to learn about the science of cookery, the effect of heating and cooling, the effect of chemical reactions, the chemistry and science of cookery. They were also, of course, learning a rich amount of history because they were having to research the different foods from the different ages of history. They were also studying geography because not only did they have to find where in the world the raw ingredients would come from, but also if they were studying foods through the ages, different places in the world where their, those foods may have, have come from in the first place. So rich in cultural experience and understanding. 
the children were learning dance and drama because they were going to put on performances in their rest restaurant based for, on different periods of history. Computer science speaks for itself because there was graphic design, there was spreadsheet work going on, massive research projects based on the use of the internet to find the information that they needed. And the fourth strand was well-being. And well-being was split into three areas, physical uh, well-being, social well-being, and spiritual well-being. Because, of course, part of the legal requirement, as I'm sure it is in Spain in England, is to teach religion and spirituality. So within those three strands of the restaurant project, the physical well-being was all about a balanced diet and healthy lifestyles. The social well-being, the children, because they were sourcing ingredients, had to understand uh, fair trade and the issues around organic farming. And the spiritual well-being, the teacher said to them, our restaurant has to be available to anybody. So you have to understand the different dietary requirements based on religion, moral perspective, and medical perspective. So you'll have to go away and research all of the different religions to find out what their diets allow people to eat and what they can't. Medical dietary issues and moral dietary issues. So I hope in a very quick moment that explains how you put together a project-based process. But joking apart, my book tells that story in great detail so you can get far more information about how you put and build a process like that. I have to say we have to be very careful of OECD and we have to be very careful of international league tables and in particular we have to be very careful about thinking Finland is the answer to everything. But Finland is a very interesting model in how they've transferred education design and development away from politicians into the hands of the education community and as a result it's reaping extraordinary reward. So 12 years ago Finland realised it had to depoliticize education and one of the things again I think is a huge challenge uh, sadly I'm not sure it ever will ever happen is I believe education policy needs to be taken out of political control otherwise you're never going to have a continuous and developmental process it's always going to be interfered with but in Finland it shows it works they spent years investing in really high-level training of teachers to raise the public trust and confidence in the teaching profession. So in order to be a qualified teacher in Finland, you have to have at least a master's qualification. Not to evidence how clever you are, but to evidence that you're capable of constant research and evolution and development. Then what they did is they handed education transformation and development over to the profession. And as a result, they've had 10 years of sustained vision and development in their education system and of course their outcomes speak for themselves. So I guess if we were to suggest to our politicians what they need to do, it's how can you depoliticize education, hand it over to a group of people, not to say that education isn't accountable, educators should always be held to account for their actions, but that we have to build a process of education that is controlled by people not just in education, but in business and in society too. We need to build, comes back to one of the first principles, a culture of true societal collaboration around education. And this is where I'll finish and everyone will go, Phew. But I guess the answer lies in an ancient African proverb, as so many answers always do. Do you remember the wonderful ancient African proverb that says, it takes a village to educate a child? That's what I would suggest we have to work to do. We are a village. We have to learn to work together to educate our children. That's it.